Welcome, everybody. This is an enormously exciting time. You're wondering who I am, and for those of you who don't know, I am Dean of the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information. My name's Jonathan Potter. I'm enormously excited to be here, and let me say a little bit about why that is. One of the things that excited me to leave Britain, land of Brexit and other things, but before all that time, uh, was the combination in Sky's school of communication, media, and information. That is the landscape, those combinations of disciplines are the landscape in which the Mike Center, the Media Inequality and Change Center, which tonight is being launched, is existing within and has the opportunity to reconfigure, to rethink. One way of seeing the central brief of the Mike Center is that it is rethinking what media is, what community is, what local participation is in the context of new and alternative platforms, of different styles of information, of new political contexts, and to think about designing new communication organizations. And I see the center as both critical, and that's rightly absolutely at the center of its brief, and also as something which will be positive, constructive, building and designing new systems, new organizations, new visions for how media and community can work. And that's an area which has been so challenged, is so much under threat across North America and indeed worldwide. When Todd Wolfson, sitting here, broached the idea of the center to me around three years ago, one thing that immediately attracted me was the potential for partnership. My very strong belief is that although higher education institutions have drifted into a mode of competition, of seeing where they sit with respect to one another on league tables and metrics, because of the world in which we live, because of the challenges that are facing us, we need to provide partnership. We need to work together. At the center of this partnership are some shared values and some really important complementarities. And those things are not unique, but they're ones which are less often exploited in our higher education terrain than I believe they should be. This was precisely what excited me and what excited, I believe, Michael Delicarpini from Annenberg when we talked about this three years ago. This shared vision and the opportunities for that. Another thing a very important thing that attracted me to Rutgers was the existence of the Gloria Steinem Chair Project. The vision to endow a chair in a public university, a highly, highly diverse public university, which would focus on the intersection of media, culture, and feminist studies. It was an enormous privilege to wor work with Gloria herself and to watch her speak truth to power in a way that was both exhilarating and occasionally made me a little bit nervous with media tycoons and serious people in big tower blocks in New York and other places. And that excitement has transferred and indeed has increased even further, if anything, now that Naomi Klein has joined us as the inaugural Gloria Steinem Chair of Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies. 
This has been an enormous privilege. Naomi's work intersects these different spaces of scholarship. It reconfigures them, it rethinks them. Its original originality is breathtaking. Its ambition is challenging to all of us, particularly those of us who've uh, sat is the wrong metaphor, but have worked comfortably in academic environments for some decades like myself. It asks us to address really difficult questions and to confront things which are, frankly, easier not to confront. And that has been fantastic, both generative and challenging. So it needn't be said, I think, although I'm going to say it, that I'm both delighted and humbled by introducing today's event, both the participation, the people who are involved here, and the vision booked that lies behind the center, and I'm looking forward to its continuation tomorrow. And with that, I'm going to pass you to Annenberg School's Victor Picard. Thank you, Jonathan. Good evening. Welcome. I want to start out by thanking our deans, John Jackson and Jonathan Potter, for their very generous support and for sharing our vision for the Mike Center. We also thank the former dean here at Annenberg, Michael Deli Carpini, um, who right now is out of the country on a very well-deserved sabbatical. About three years ago, when we first proposed to Michael our idea of a joint research center between Penn Annenberg and Rutgers focused on media and inequality, Michael thought it was a great idea, and he told us to just run with it. So we're very grateful for that. And Michael continues to support us uh, as a board member for the Mike Center. The Mike Center is fairly unconventional. It's a partnership between a private and public university. It focuses on local struggles and activist projects here in Philly and New Jersey, but also engages with national policy debates like the future of journalism, net neutrality, the digital divide, as well as labor practices and policies here in the US and abroad. And one of the bigger projects that we're beginning to take on right now is to try to figure out what a truly public and democratic media system would look like uh, from the ground up, beginning with local newsrooms and infrastructures, but also including questions around governance and funding models. So this will be a very uh, large and ambitious project. It'll keep us busy probably for a very long time. But first and foremost, the Mike Center is focused on confronting structural inequalities in all areas of social life, including their intersections with race, gender, sexuality, and class. And it's driven by an explicit commitment to social justice. Early on, we knew that the Mike Center wouldn't just be a traditional research center. We knew it would be also an activist center engaged with social problems and social movements. And Todd and I both have participated in and studied media activism for many, many years. Uh, a long time ago, we first met uh, through our research on indie media. Some of you might remember uh, this radical democratic experiment in the late 90s, early 2000s that came out of the global justice movement. And as Todd and I shared notes and, and talked shop, we realized we had a lot of intellectual interests in common. I approach social problems from a political economic analysis. Todd comes at it from more of a, a background in anthropology, studying social movements, as well as being embedded in various activist projects here in Philly. But these two approaches complement each other, and they bring us to a similar place, which is trying to answer the age-old question, what is to be done? And as media scholars, we both agree that at least part of the answer involves our communication systems. Everything from news media to social media are critical sites of engagement where social problems are perpetuated or confronted, where inequities are exacerbated or contested. And though things have seemed more dystopian in recent years, our media still provide the potential for change and for democratic possibilities. So Todd and I joined forces. And over a series of conversations, we sketched out, sometimes on bar napkins, what a new center might look like. And this past year, we've already launched a number of exciting initiatives. I think Todd's going to mention a few of these in a minute. But most importantly, we see this as an ongoing conversation with all of you. We're here to learn from you, to create new partnerships, 
and together ascertain what needs to be done. So I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank our speakers. We're so fortunate to have Naomi Klein here this, this evening. And I also want to thank all the folks who helped organize this event, especially our program manager, Briar Smith, who's done a tremendous amount of amazing work, not just for this event, but for moving our center and all of our many projects forward. And finally, I'd like to welcome my dear friend and collaborator, Todd Wolfson, to the mic. Thanks, Victor. I, I, I think we've come a long way since those bar napkins. Um, though I, I, wouldn't, I would hope no one could see them. I'm a little nervous about what they look like. Um, so at the outset, I want to say how lucky I feel to get to do this work with Victor and also with Briar. Um, since the three of us have been working together, I've been challenged by both of them to think bigger and to think more strategically. And it's really been an honor. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Um, thank you all also for coming and joining us tonight. The launch of Mike comes at an exciting time, but also a very challenging time. The late revolutionary Grace Lee Boggs once asked us to consider, what time is it on the clock of the world? Today, we find ourselves in a moment of devastating ecological collapse, unprecedented concentration of wealth and power, staggering state violence, particularly against communities of color, a rapid resurgence of fascist formations, incisive attacks on our democratic institutions and the basic rights we have, and a weakened fourth estate, which threatens our very ability to have the true and meaningful dialogue we need to answer the questions in front of us. At the same time, and in response to these urgent threats, we're witnessing a new wave of resistance emerge across the globe to challenge autocracy, white supremacy, and the logic of capitalism, which Naomi recently characterized as the gig and dig economy, endlessly extractive of labor and the planet's finite resources. The resistance that we're watching now emerged in its current form on the heels of the 2008 economic crisis circling the globe from North Africa to Hong Kong. And we've watched it for almost a decade, and we've watched it dynamically transform in an effort to build power and change our collective course. As a social movement scholar, it's been inspiring to watch it. And I also want to mark that that social movement that we're watching emerge and grow is the answer, the only answer to the challenges we face. And so it's within this context that Victor and I began talking about Mike. As Victor explained, there was many discussions in many different places. But one night, I remember us talking about our careers, the world, and our role in it, and particularly the ability of the academy to intervene in the problems in front of us. Our discussion turned also to the ecosystem of academic centers that are out there, and how there were few, if any, academic projects that were able to occupy the intersection between research and action community and university. As both scholars and community organizers, Victor and I see Mike as stepping directly into this void to forge new solutions to these challenging times, particularly by uniting scholarship and action. One of my favorite thinkers once said, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, but the point is to change it. This is the vision that unites Victor and I. We both believe in creating a platform to bring together scholars and community members, scientists and policy makers, organizers and journalists, media activists and advocates into one conversation. We aim to study key questions and then forge solutions, sometimes policy solutions, sometimes organizing solutions, but always responses that deeply engage the communities around us in the service of positive social change. Since Mike started, we established a working group focused on the platform economy and the future of the city, and we've been working with Helen Gim's office, we've been working with the mayor's office. Um, we also, and th the goal of this is to support workers struggling in the gig economy in particular. We also launched a community and journalist exchange with media mobilizing project, The Inquirer and the Daily, Philadelphia Daily News, which connects local journalists and advocates on key issues from poverty to housing and public education. These engaged projects will be the calling card of the Mike Center. And if it calls you, we want to collaborate. If you want to figure out new strategies for local journalism, new policy approaches to the future of work, 
If you want to develop projects that support social movements, media activism, or the organizing power of working people, then we want to partner. To, con to continue this journey tonight, we have an exciting conversation between Naomi Klein, my new colleague, which is amazing, and the Dean of Annenberg, John Jackson. This conversation and the launch in general, it's important to say, would not be possible without some partners. We got generous support from Open Society Foundations, from the Media Democracy Fund, and of course, from both Annenberg School for Communication and Rutgers School of Communication and Information. I think we also wanna take a moment to, to thank the Mike affiliates and fellows who have been supporting us along the way, and also the advisory board, which we got to meet together for the first time today. So that includes Juan Gonzalez, Amalia Deloney, Helen Gim, Michelle Miller, Mark Lamont Hill, Des Freeman, Michael Della Carpini, and Phil Napoli. And following Victor, I also want to send out a special thanks to both Deans Potter and Della Carpini for supporting us from the beginning of this project and helping us get where we're going. And now it's my honor to introduce another person that helped make Mike a reality. So when I was getting my PhD at Penn, I was lucky to have John Jackson on my committee. Um, John was the type of committee member every doctoral student wants, as he was generous and supportive with me, which sometimes I needed. Um, but he was also able to ask questions routinely that really pressed me to reimagine my work site and my research in ways that changed my perspective. So it was really productive. And of course, alongside being a great committee member and dean here, uh, John is a world-renowned scholar and filmmaker. So I want to introduce. John Jackson. Sometimes I try to imagine that I'm not quite as old as I actually am. And then people who also seem very old <laughs> remind me that I'm in fact ancient. Um, thank you, uh, Todd. Victor, Jonathan, um, I also want to reiterate that I know Brian has worked so hard on this event and so much else. So all I want to do right now is introduce our guest of honor. Um, it'll be a conversation, but really our job is to learn from this amazing scholar and public intellectual. Naomi Klein, as you all know, is an award-winning journalist, syndicated columnist, and New York Times best-selling author of No Logo, the shock doctrine, this changes everything, no is not enough, and the battle for paradise. And these books, these important transformational books, thought-provoking texts have been published and translated in over 30 languages around the world. She's senior correspondent for The Intercept, a contributor to The Nation, and a Puffin Writing Fellow of Type Media Institute. Some of her recent articles have appeared in journals and newspapers like the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Boston Globe, the Guardian, the London Review of Books, and Le Monde. She's the founder of Canada's Leap Manifesto, which is a blueprint for a rapid and justice-based transition off of fossil fuels, which has inspired similar climate justice initiatives all around the planet. In 2016, she was awarded Australia's prestigious Sydney Peace Prize for, amongst other things, quote, exposing the structural causes and responsibility for the climate crisis, end quote. In 2018, as you've already heard, she was named the inaugural Gloria Steinem Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies at Rutgers University. And her next book, on fire will be published worldwide later this year. Please join me in welcoming our guest of honor, Naomi Klein. So can you hear me? Um, these are big chairs, by the way. Um, so many of you 
don't know this, so though some of you do, before I became the dean of the Annenberg School, I was for four and a half years dean of Penn's School of Social Policy and Practice, but we like to call it Penn's Social Justice School. And one of the things, one of the many things um, that made me excited about coming back to Annenberg, where I was before, um, even though I enjoyed what we were doing at Social Policy and Practice, was that this moment in particular, at least to me, feels like a space that, in a moment, a time, that is rife and, and, and rife with issues that are ripe for the kind of specialty and expertise of the Annenberg School and its faculty. One of the things I've been trying to wrap my head around is exactly how to get students to think about the link between social justice, which a lot of our students are invested in, and the contemporary social media landscape. Um, and to do it in a way that doesn't feel doctrinaire or simplistic, right? So, so part of what I know we were trying to do at SP2 that I know is exciting to me about some of these new institutional spaces at Annenberg that are organized around thinking through social justice, like Mike, like the Center for Media at Risk, is to try to get students to be critical thinkers, and I would also argue critical feelers, as they try to engage the contemporary moment um, and think about it as robustly, as carefully, um, and as affectively, richly as possible. And so that's a long-winded way to say the one thing I want to start off with is your take on, your perspective on pedagogy in this moment. So I know we talked very briefly um, a week ago, and you were telling me about a class that you're teaching now. And so what I thought might be a fun place to begin is with you in the classroom, um, telling us about that offering, um, about how it's organized, what you're trying to get the students to do in that space, and maybe we can use that to open up into a larger conversation about what your scholarship does more generally. Mm -hmm. Was that okay? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you everybody for being here and all of those um, wonderful introductions and, um, and huge congratulations uh, on, the, on the opening of this, of this center and the beginning of this wonderful conference. There's so many great speakers here and old friends of mine um, who um, you know, I've just been thrilled to, to reconnect with. Um, and I think the need for it is so urgent, um, especially because when, you know, when we think about the, the sort of cataclysmic events of recent years, almost every one of them has taken our media elites by surprise precisely because they aren't reckoning with inequality. Um, the, because we have an elite media culture that has benefited so extravagantly from the, the boom times at the top. Um, and, and so, you know, Brexit um, and Trump and even the, the, the so-called anti-globalization movement and Occupy, every one of them came as this, what? Where did this come from? Like, we thought everything was going okay. It was pretty much all right. Um, and, and, and so that disconnection, right, between uh, the people whose job it is to tell the official stories of the culture um, and the majority of the, the population's lived experience keeps producing these shock moments, right, um, where you know, we're, we are all paying such deep price for that, for that media failure, and the reasons for that are complex, obviously. Um, but it is connected to what's happening with digital media, and this is really, um, you know, I, you know I, am, I, I don't come from academia. This job that um, I get to hold for three years, this rotating chair, is a really special one because um, when my, my friend Juan Gonzalez sent me the, um, the, the, the posting for it, um, you know, I'd never sort of seen a job description like this. It was specifically looking for some, somebody who was, could be from the world of activism, could be from the world of journalism, could be from academia, but left that open precisely because Gloria Steinem uh, traveled between those worlds, right? Um, and, and, it, and, and the whole idea of the chair is to cross the, those boundaries. And so that's a special way to enter academia. Um, and, and then I've been so lucky that Dean Potter has 
been really clear from the beginning that, that you know, I guess they could have had me teaching like really, you know, big courses and so on. And, and, um, and I've been able to actually have a very small group, uh, uh, you know, a, a seminar size, you know, 15 person, um, uh, upper level undergraduate uh, uh, course and design the course, you know, in a way that would really interest me. And so I'm teaching this course called The Corporate Self. And it brings me back to the research that I did now more than 20 years ago. No, it, this is almost the, it, precisely the 20 year anniversary of the publication of No Logo, which was my first book, which for, you know, some of you may be familiar with it. I'm sure most of you aren't, but this was um, you know, a, a book about the rise of, uh, of the, the lifestyle brands that, you know, that we all take for granted now. But the, or the, the emergence of this idea that corporations should be selling um, sort of transcendent ideas as opposed to products, and, and that divorce between um, between between the, the the brand and the product, and then the way in which individuals started being marketed as themselves as brands, right? And so this is really where I started, and when when the logo came out, I kind of was overloaded with the whole world of marketing. And um, it had been a really immersive experience to write that book. And I was kind of tired of it. And then when, it, when it came out, it was this um, sort of crest moment for political activism, taking, really going to the root causes of what had produced this sort of triumphant corporate moment. And it was more looking at the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, you know, the systems that produced it. And so for me, it was kind of more interesting to kind of leave the marketing side of it behind and then and, and focus on really more on the kind of hard economics. And that's when I ended up doing the research that led to the shock doctrine and so on. But I've really been finding in recent years that I really am drawn back to that material because so much has changed in 20 years with the, I, you know, now it's, you know, absolutely taken for granted. And this is true for, I think, all of our students that they are growing up being told from an incredibly early age, like not high school, middle school, you know, that they need to be thinking about how they're going to be marketing themselves to get into the top universities. Um, they're choosing, you know, hobbies they're to, um, because they think it'll look good on their resume, not because they're interested in it. Um, every social media post, they are imagining how it could be read by a future employer. Um, and that sort of separation of the self and um, with the idea of the self, right? The consumable self is so deep in their experience, right? So we're exploring all of this in, in the class. So, so going from the, starting with Simone Brown's work um, on the branding of bodies in the transatlantic uh, slave trade and that actually being the beginning of surveillance capitalism um, and, uh, and, and uh, the, 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 the um, surveilling of bodies using technology, even if a, a different technology than the way we think of it today. Um, and, and starting there and then going through this, the, the, the conditions that created the pressure on their generation to see themselves as these consumable products from so early on I've really been pushing, uh, pushing on this. You know, it isn't just a cultural story; it's an economic story, right? There, it, that precarity is, um, you know, it, that that sense of just <laughs> endless competition that they have, and 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 this the this feeling of scarcity that they're growing up with. It's real, right? So it's I mean, it's 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 a real challenge, I think, pedagogically to study this because they're living it, right? Mm -hmm. And the same is true for where we're at spending most of the course is how we go from this idea that you have to perform yourself, put yourself under constant surveillance in order to become this marketable commodity to now this dominant business model. But, but for the tech companies, we're actually, they're not that interested in us as products. They're interested in us as a raw resource. Mm -hmm. They're interested in us as raw data. That's what's really, so we kind of got suckered into performing ourselves <laughs> online. Um, and this idea that we're all special snowflakes with our personal brand. But now, then it turns out actually, um, it, the whole point was just to move uh, the offline self uh, online into 
a sphere where it could be extracted, mm -hmm. um, like Shoshana Zuboff says, like virgin wood, right? Um, so it's actually the opposite in this weird way of, of the way it was sold, like that you, are, you have to find your authentic self and all of the discourse around personal branding is all about authenticity. And then suddenly you find out, actually, you're not interesting at all. You're just this sort of data point um, you know, filling this, uh, you know, this pipeline of data that is, that, you know, that is just looking for patterns, right? So it's a real bait and switch. Um, so, you know, it's, I've learned as much from the students, I, I'm sure, as they have from me. Um, they are, you know, Michelle Miller, who's here, she came to speak to, to, to my class. We, we were really lucky. And, and she, and had, I think, had an enormous impact just because she was talking about tech workers organizing. And the biggest uh, force that I come up with with the students is just their feelings of powerlessness, mm. right? That they, I, they, they're, they're being taught to think critically, but they are simultaneously feeling all of the pressures to do these things, to brand themselves, uh, to commodify themselves, um, to ev even like if they do go into these sectors to data mine, you know, do, you know, I've had students say, well, look, if I was doing this business, you know, if I if I started a business, I would I would do the same thing. Like everybody's doing it. We've got, you know, we've we've got to extract data and and sell it to third parties. We don't know how else to make money. Um, so it's a ch it's challenging to figure out how like how to have any distance mm. when, when these students are so enmeshed in it as future media makers um, and you know, at media industry workers. But I do think that just being able to question and not take it all for granted, um, to hear stories of how people are changing the rules, coming together, feeling more powerful, that's been a real, a real game changer. Very cool. Yeah. So just as an aside, and I promise not to have too many of these. You know, one of the things that struck me at the beginning of your remarks was the kind of um, discomfort, potentially, with your very intelligibility in the academy, right? Um, that there's something about how we think and um, constitute scholarship that might not seem to be expansive enough um, to allow for the kind of history you have, the kind of work and interventions you've made. I mean, we've been trying to think, and we as a whole bunch of scholars across you know, a lot of campuses, but especially here at Penn, what it means to redefine what counts as scholarship, right? Mm -hmm, to to mm -hmm. open that category up so that it's not the exclusive province of a few folks behind ivory towers. And it seems to me like some of that's also at stake, both in your new home, institutional home at Rutgers, but also in a version of what your project is there and what it could be for the students and faculty around you, know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that being at the School of Communications and there being a lot of the students who are interested in, um, you know, working in media and trying to figure out how to do that. I mean, they're sort of trying to figure out what to make of me because I haven't followed the traditional academic route. Um, and I'm not encouraging anybody to drop out or anything. <laughs> but. Um, but I mean, I certainly have heard a lot of frustration from people, from from you know, and when I've spoken to grad students in particular, of just the kind of time lags, um, where the the speed of the culture is so intense, and the speed of change within these sectors is so intense that by the time you get an academic piece published, you know, the whole platform has changed and it's no longer relevant, right? Um, and so, you know, that I think that that is a challenge to academic publishing, but I'm not sure that the solution is just to speed it up, right? I mean, I think that what it means is that the work has to be better. <laughs> like, I mean, if, if, if the work is just like, like, like the, the, that what will stay relevant in the timelines of academic publishing can't be quite as sort of minute as a lot of what we see out of academic publishing. Like it has to, it has to be more ambitious in what it's trying to contribute. Um, and, and, you know, and, and then there's just the pressure of, you know, academics themselves, I think, feeling like they have to be branding themselves and simultaneously competing in this economy of attention and celebrity um, and what that does to the idea of actually taking the time that is required to produce lasting work, 
you know, I don't come out, uh, uh, you know, I didn't go the academic route, but I, I have a really, I've gone a really non-traditional route with my work, right? Like, no, no Logo was this freak success in the world of publishing, and it bought me the ability to take five years to publish my next book and to have a team of research assistants um, and to basically set up my own little think tank um, you know, that spanned three countries to do the shock doctrine, to have, to set up our own you know, academic review mm -hmm. process, which I did for This Changes Everything. I mean, I had you know, a team of five climate scientists reading all the science. I had a team of social scientists reading all the social science research. I mean, that takes resources, right? But it also takes time to believe that you will not be forgotten if you shut up. <laughs> you know? um, and I think that, that is, that's a huge problem that this generation is facing, and not just this, like anybody working today, where it's such an amnesiac culture. We're all watching the speed of, you know, of, of uh, you know, how quickly people can sort of be forgotten and thrown away that people aren't giving themselves the time that they need to make work that will last, especially work you know, it, it, within these academic timelines, right? Uh, so there's a lot of contradictory pressures right now. Um, and I think we have to talk more openly about what it actually looks like to produce academic work that is going to matter on the timelines of academic publishing. I appreciate that. And maybe the point isn't even you know, to think about reasons for people to drop out of the academy and go into law, but to reconfigure this place so more people feel like they can come in and get the stuff done yeah. that's important to them, right? Yeah. Um, so if you were asked, as you're about to be right now, um, <laughs> how you'd characterize um, any potential bridges between, say, disaster capitalism and surveillance capitalism, mm. how do you map that journey? How would you put the two in conversation for us, if at all? Yeah. I mean, I think they're very much in conversation. I, 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 they are, I mean, they're, the, the maybe story. Maybe you should tell them what disaster capitalism is. Right, maybe OK. <laughs> sure, why don't you do it? <laughs> um, right, well, so, so the, this phrase, disaster capitalism, I started using. Um, after the invasion of Iraq, and um, I wrote a piece in 2004 or five for the nation called The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. Um, and it was actually after the um, Asian tsunami. And I had been covering the occupation of Iraq um, for Harper's and other publications. And I, like, I went to Iraq after the, after the invasion to cover the economic side of what was happening there. So sort of, I mean, this is those of you who remember the sort of the Paul Bremer era of the, the, the occupation, right? The business suits and combat boots, uh, green zone, uh, you know, 23 year olds from the State Department coming in to, you know, write Iraq's budget and privatize their assets and so on. Um, and Avi and I, uh, my partner Avi Lewis, we had been living in Argentina uh, making a film called The Take about uh, workers who, uh, in the midst of the economic crisis in Argentina, a after 2001, there had been a huge amount of capital flight. And in the sort of rubble of that economy, there were some really interesting economic experiments that came out. And it was kind of a precursor to 2008, what happened in Argentina in those, in those years. And one of the things that happened was there was a wave of, of factory takeovers. So. Um, I think learning about how, from our friends in Argentina about the history of neoliberalism in Latin America and how violent the, um, the, the process had been just taught me a huge amount about, and this is a long answer, way more than I should go into about what disaster capitalism is, but um, I, I, you know, I, I often say like to my friends in Latin America that the shock doctrine is like the Latin, the, the Argentinian analysis applied to the world, <laughs> um, because the um, the sort of popular analysis, like not anything that is just, you know, you have to read a book for everybody in Argentina, like that you would talk to, um, has an analysis around shock and how the shock of the military coup 
and not just in Argentina, but in Chile, in Uruguay, and the whole southern cone in the 70s, was used to introduce the neoliberal project, right? That the, um, that the terror, uh, the violence, that, 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 and, and the, the, the use of literal shocks on people's bodies, as, as Eduardo Galeano said, that, the, that the, the shock of the electric prods was required for the economic shocks. Um, and so understanding that analysis changed how I covered the invasion of Iraq. So that was an invasion that was called shock and awe. That was its brand. Um, and immediately after, there was this push to apply economic shock therapy to Iraq. Quite, and they were very open about it. Um, they brought in teams of economists from Eastern Europe who had, had imposed shock therapy on their e economies after the collapse of the Soviet Union to train the Iraqis about how they should very, very quickly, while people were still scrambling, um, you know, without electricity, without anything, to, to privatize their economy, to get rid of labor law protections and so on. And, you know, and they tried. Um, so what I started to notice was that this was happening in the aftermath of natural disasters as well, and that there was this whole economy of privatized disaster response, or what I call the disaster capitalism complex, that you know, was the Halliburtons and the Bechtels and the Blackwaters and all of them, that they were migrating, they needed a new market. Um, and, and what they kind of saw climate change and natural disasters, as well as immigration, related to these natural disasters, as a much more stable market than wars. And so immediately, like after Hurricane Katrina, you saw the whole Baghdad gang, right? It was like people were saying it was Baghdad on the bayou. It was, it was all the same, the same companies that, were, that showed up within days. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of it with the immigration detention centers. And so, there, so where it fits in with surveillance capitalism, and, and Shoshana Zuboff talks about this, she says it emerged from, from two shocks, <laughs> um, that there actually was a um, much more of a, a, a discussion about privacy, data protection, um, and uh, and and you know she tells a story around Google, and I have you know a difference of opinion with her around the extent to which there ever could have been another <laughs> business model than the one we ended up with. But she, I think she rightly points out that when Google started, it was not you know they they had more respect for users' privacy. Um, they talked a really good game, you know, don't be evil and so on. Um, and the game changer was twofold. One, um, it was the dot-com bubble bursting and the venture capitalists panicking and saying, you need to show us how you're going to have, you know, sustainable profits right away. And that created, that, that threat that they were going to lose their investment led them to compromise, you know, their, their so-called ethics, which I'm, like, I'm not totally sure they ever had. Um, and, and then the other, the other shock was, was September 11th, where before 9-11, there was some fairly serious talk of regulating uh, 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 um, the tech sector to protect consumer privacy. But after 9-11, the U.S. government wanted access to all that data. They didn't want to protect it. They wanted these companies to hoover up as much as possible, and what they wanted was to make sure they had a back door, right? So the whole idea that the government was going to say, no, no, don't protect it, of course not. That's the whole point of the Patriot Act, right, is actually just to get it. So I think that that is a really powerful example of, and, and, uh, and so, you know, I, when I was writing The Shock Doctrine, I was, I have a lot in that book about how 9-11 created, like opened up this spigot of government cash for all of these companies to get into the surveillance in industry. Um, I, what I didn't know at all at the time was the extent to which it was going to enable the emergence of this entire business model that was about, you know, I, like I think it is fair to understand the, the moment that we're living in as, as like, the third great capitalist enclosure, right? That the, the first phase is land and, and, and labor. Um, the, the next phase is the neoliberal period with the enclosing of the commons and the, the state. And now it is the privatization of our very selves and relationships that first get moved online and then get privatized as data. Um, so, I mean, I could never have 
foreseen it in the research that I was doing, but now looking retroactively at that sort of fork in the road and what and just so much changed in that moment. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so I've heard at least a few, and I'll let you take a little drink of water. Um, I've heard at least a few people argue that part of what defines the contemporary media moment is that we're all so complicit in our own everyday surveillance, right? Mm -hmm. Very um, purposefully. Um, that it's, it's a hard sell to imagine convincing people that the kinds of dangers that surveillance capitalism tries to thematize for folks um, will be something that gets them really riled up, right? I mean, we, we've so obliterated notions of privacy right, right. Um, that it's hard to even imagine people even thinking about what the alternative might be. Um, is that something that we should be concerned about, or do you think that's, that's not really a legitimate um, critique of why we might be slow-footed in our attempts to address this issue? No, I think, Organize yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and you, uh, there, I don't know if a, how many people have seen these new Apple ads where they're rebranding themselves as the privacy company, right, with the lock, right? Um, and one of the things that interested me about those ads is that they almost seem to be sort of educating people about the concept of privacy. <laughs> you know, like most of the ad is just like, this is privacy. This is why you might want it, you know? <laughs> um, buy from Apple. Um, so we are pretty, yeah, we are pretty far, far gone. I mean, I, to be honest with you, I think that we've done a poor job of explaining the stakes. Um, and it feels very abstract in the way that a lot of the literature is, 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 is being written. Um, and I guess I think for, if you've never, ha if you've never experienced um, a private self, right? Because you have been, you know, since you were 11, right? Um, had a smartphone and, and, or at least access to it and the, your idea of fun was chatting online with friends, um, then it's a, it's a hard concept to introduce. I also think we haven't quite theorized enough the, ex, the, the role of reality TV in creating like entertainment out of surveillance. Like if you, the, I mean the basic principle of every single reality television show is here's a bunch of good looking people under surveillance all the time, right? Um, and if those are your, you know, if these are your cultural icons and influencers and, and idols, um, then why are you going to believe that you ha have a right to privacy when your entertainment is just watching people give up their privacy in exchange for celebrity? Um, so there's that. I mean, I do think reality television has a lot to answer for, you know, <laughs> in pretty much every way. Um, so, but yeah, I think the stakes. I think the stakes of it. People still assume that the biggest problem we're going to have is that it's going to be sold to, sold to advertisers. Yeah. Um, and as one of my students said, like I'd rather see ads for clothes that I actually like, you know, than ads for clothes, you know, for like some guy who's like, you know, six foot. You know, I'd ra I'd rather see some cute shoes, you know. <laughs> and so if that's what people are taking from what they're reading, then that and we're doing a really really poor job. Um, and so, I, th I you know, I, I think that 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 is starting to change in the analysis around um, policing, racial profiling. Um, you know, what this is going to mean for for um, you know who gets profiled for what job, um, who even makes it to an interview uh, in the first place. And and this is where I think the penny drops for people that it's not okay. Like you're not going to make the argument saying you, you have a like, I mean, Shoshana Zuboff says, like, you have a, a right to your private self. And I think that is a really, or she, she actually has a line, I, I, when I did an event with her in New York, and she said, you know, you, you should not have to hide in your own life. Um, and, you know, that line was resonant with some of, some of my students. But like I said, I think if you've never had that freedom, if you've always assumed a certain level of surveillance that your phone was looking back at you, um, that your books are looking back at you, that your computer is looking back at you. Like if you're living with that, then um, it's a hard, it's a it's a hard thing to get people excited about. But I think the idea that there are these algorithms that 
employers are using that are going to tell people that they shouldn't even give you an interview because of the way in which they're, they're analyzing your social media posts or various other indicators and that are completely biased. You know, I th that, that's the kind of thing that I think people will get worked up about. But I do have concerns a little bit around the sort of limitations around the sort of ethics of AI where it's kind of like, okay, well, we just need to make sure that it has good data, that it isn't sexist, that it isn't racist, you know, that, it, it, that it's not homophobic, and like we're going to somehow clean up the data, and then we'll have like good surveillance, you know? <laughs> and to me, like that's, you know, that's, a wor that's worrying to me in the sa same way that I find, you know, some kind of identity politics worrying where it's just kind of like, it kind of like equal access to machines for destruction, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like, so far, this is the, these are the limits of the paradigms that I see right now in, in the way we're critiquing it. That it's just about ads, or it's just about inequitable surveillance. <laughs> um, and, and so I think we need to poke at both of those. We need to do a better job of really understanding the stakes, right? The advertisers are the first sector that are, have figured out how to monetize this data. Every single sector in the economy is do, trying to figure it out, is trying to unlock it. And the really scary part is when the surveillance state and the surveillance corporations merge, right? And we're seeing that in China, we're seeing it in India. Um, and so you know, I think this is how we start to, 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 to make it not just like, OK, well, why should I really care? Yeah. You know? No, thank you. So we're going to open it up in a little bit, but I have maybe a couple more questions for you before we do. But um, I'm sure there'll be better ones from the folks out there. So why should we not just all be sort of conspiracist about all this, right? Like the, the, there's a version, I think, of, of how, and I'm someone who, as an anthropologist, studies yes, conspiracy yes, yes. theorists and, um, and the seductiveness of that logic. And in some ways, you always want to just be, at first glance, dismissive of it. Um, but there is an argument that says a kind of healthy form of almost kind of conspiracist thinking seems not just in order, but maybe most operative in the contemporary moment, given the kinds of things we know about what's happening. Both what's happening in terms of how some of this data is used, but then also, you know, you bring up Apple and other um, sort of new media companies. Also, all these odd news stories we find out about, you know, how people can, you know, listen to your phone when you don't know about it. And, and that has yeah. to be plugged and fixed yes. and should have never been a possibility to begin with. Right, and right, right. and so, so, so explain to me at least, maybe not them, they might not yeah. care, but explain to me why I shouldn't be a kind of conspiracy theorist around some of this stuff in ways that um, maybe push us into a realm that says this might even be more calculated than some of us might imagine, both in terms of maybe the potential links between the state and um, corporations, but also this um, really op opaque way in which we interface with some of this new technology, right? We often don't know how it works, why it works. We know right. we benefit from it, but there's a version of sort of what yeah. that benefit is predicated on that also means we should probably not be suspicious of it or no? T tell me why we should think <laughs> differently about that. Look, I think we should be sus very suspicious of it, um, and we should be creating um, as many redundancies as possible so that we aren't as dependent on it as, and and I think that we are, you know, frankly, in a bit of a window where we can use some of the technologies to create those redundancies. Um, like, for instance, the Google walkout. I mean, that to me was, you know, one of the really hopeful. Um, you know, it, it continues to be that movement within Google, and not just that, not just the Google walkout, but I mean, Google, the Google workers have done some incredible things and continue to do some incredible things in terms of pushing the company not to produce for the Pentagon, you know, with Project Maven and Google was um, selling, uh, uh, was collaborating with the Pentagon to improve the um, e the e efficiency of drone strikes or, um, and they pushed back, Google workers pushed back on that and, and they canceled the contract. Um, uh, the Google walkout, was spurred by finding out that a Google executive was paid, I think, $90 million, or up, upwards of $90 million um, after a sexual harassment complaint, basically just to go away. Um, and that opened up this huge deb debate about various kinds of inequalities within Google. 
No, but what's it, and 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 people people talked about the sort of irony that they were using all of this Google tech to organize that they were using, um, <clears throat> you know, they they all of it, you know, um, and they built it, so maybe they should be able to use it. But I mean, obviously Google can shut it down, right? Um, so I think there is this window where we can use the tech to create redundancies, like face-to-face -face meetings, um, and and I th frankly I think we need. We need commons media. <laughs> and this is something that I really hope that this center can focus on. And this is where I find the research on surveillance capitalism and how it emerged really, really important, is this is an illegitimate business model. <laughs> this is an illegitimate business model. They never had permission, right? It was all about racing ahead of regulators, um, trying to create precedents, um, and just sort of using the sort of facts on the ground strategy around all of it, right? Whether it's you know Google Earth and taking pictures of all of our homes, um, you know, or whether it, it, the idea that they even have the right to sell this data to third parties, it's really, really legally dubious. Um, and this is where I think the the parallels with colonialism that you know some theorists I, I mean Shoshana Zuboff writes about this and so does Nick Coldry with the you know and uh, in in his work on data colonialism and I, I'm like a little uncomfortable with the direct parallels with colonialism but it is interesting when you think about the requerimientos and the conquistadors you know coming to indigenous countries you know where people don't speak Spanish and reading you know uh, you know uh, uh, this impenetrable text explaining the doctrine of discovery and um, that we now own your land and you know we'll kill you if you resist in Spanish and you know like put your finger here to show that you understand as being the equivalent of the terms of service agreement right um, I think but I, I do think that's useful in the sense that this is this was not a legitimate exchange right and so I what I what I try to unpack with my students is the extent to which we have built these companies. We have built them. We have built it with our free labor, our hope labor, whatever you want to call it. You know, behavioral we, surplus. <laughs> we, yeah, with our data that they never asked for, with our creativity, you know, with our tweets, with our Facebook posts, with uh, with all of it, we built it. Um, they never had a right to claim it. And so I really think we need to be talking about how we can have the benefits of these technologies with with without giving up what we're being asked to give up while keeping the benefits, including the profits, in our communities, um, how it could fund media, <laughs> because they're, you know, they are systematically destroying the business model of, of, of media outlets. Uh, and so that's, that's where I find it really, really useful. So I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. I think it's a business model. I think it's an illegitimate business model. I'm into delegitimizing business models. I think fossil fuel <laughs> fossil fuel companies also have an illegitimate business model. And, you know, in the same way that, you know, it's it's not legitimate to hoard profits when you're offloading the costs on, you know, knowingly when you've knowingly lied and so on. So I think we need to do that research to to fundamentally delegitimize the business model, to create the argument for how we can have um, tech that really benefits us, platforms where we communicate. I mean, if they are occupying the space of the town hall, if these companies, you know, whether we're talking about Facebook or Google, you know, or Twitter, they didn't have a business model for a decade, you know, where all they did was act as if they were the town square, gave their product for free. Um, we actually do have a right to talk with each other, right? Um, to connect with each other. Uh, and the whole thing was a bait and switch, right? Was, and so it turned out that we all just got addicted with these, you know, free, uh, with, these, with these free services. Um, but this is, and this is where I think there needs to be some really good theory, right? Like, we have a right to news. We have a right to a town square. If this is happening online, what, what is the what what is the public ownership model or the collective ownership model that gives us to the, the right to these tools um, without putting us under surveillance um, and 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 giving us no agency um, and having these incredible asymmetries of knowledge where we as you said we don't understand how it works there's an absolute black box around the information of how it works it's all you know, it's all proprietary information. It doesn't have to be, right? So yeah, it's a bit of a rant, but I really do think that there's a lot of work that needs to 
um, go into really figuring out how they did this. And I, I think like we owe a huge debt to Shoshana Zuboff. I know the book is long. Everybody should read it. Um, <laughs> Because, because it really systematically shows, and she's, you know, she comes from the Harvard Business School, like she's not a raving anti-capitalist like me. You know, she, <laughs> you know, she's saying, this is, like, she's, she, she, she is, uh, is, is making, I think, really legitimate comparisons with previous business models, which maybe were not ideal, but there were at least some lines of accountability between you know, a manufacturer and their workforce, a manufacturer and the people who bought their product, and a manufacturer and the community where that, you know, that, that, that factory was. And now we have the richest companies on earth without any systems of accountability. They are, you know, they, they, the, the people who make the, the, the content, they don't acknowledge our, work, our working. Um, and, and their users are not their customers. Their customers are our third parties that we don't know who they are. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's a conspiracy. I think it's just a really, really dangerous business model that has a synergy mm. with the imperative of a state. Um, well, not the imperative, but that has a synergy with with states that I think are becoming increasingly authoritarian, mm -hmm. and always were <laughs> authoritarian, but are becoming more so. So as more and more governments sort of tip into open authoritarianism, and we're seeing this, like with Modi, we're seeing it with Duterte, um, you, you have these trends where more and more life you know, has to be cashless, has to be, you know, everything is going through these central, centralized IDs. Um, and you know the tech companies have to collaborate with the state. So it's not a conspiracy. It's just a synergy of interests. Um, they don't want to be regulated, um, and 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 these governments want control over their populations. But I actually feel like we've got a pretty short window where we still have the freedom to organize um, in 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 a, in a way that this wouldn't be a foregone conclusion. No, thank you. So so when you think about organizing mm -hmm. and you know so the theme of the next two days future of work future of journalism um, there's also a question about the future of the planet um, can you tell us a little that old bit thing. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you tell us a little bit about the argument um, in on fire mm -hmm. and the ways in which you're thinking about questions of, of climate change and climate care in the context of your critiques of capitalism mm -hmm. yeah that's a lot um, well, I mean, I mean, it's interesting because, and, and Todd alluded to this, you know, of all of these 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 social movements that have spread like wildfire, right? Um, because of these very technologies, um, and you know, we are in this moment where the the, it turns out that so many of the dire predictions from climate scientists were actually conservative, um, that a lot of climate impacts that we thought weren't going to be hitting until you know, mid-century are happening now. Um, the latest research about the Arctic is really, really, really scary. I mean, we're talking that we're getting very close to um, you know, total sea ice loss. Um, and it, it, the Arctic is just warming so much faster than, um, than, than the rest of the planet. And so, you know, people you know, here have memories of Superstorm Sandy. I mean, this is all related. And, and, you know, I came to write about climate change after covering Hurricane Katrina. And, so, and it's really un understanding that a lot of the ways that we've talked about climate change has been sort of abstracted, and I think this is much less true now, but abstracted from economic justice, racial justice, um, human rights, like which were my areas of concern. And, and then, you know, Katrina hits and you see what happens when the legacy of white supremacy and neoliberalism um, get a head-on hit from, you know, a, a, a superstorm. And it all mixes up together, and um, and this is what climate change looks like, right? It looks, it isn't, and I've said this before, and it, you know, it's not just about things getting 
hotter and wetter. It's also about things getting meaner and crueler. And, and so, you know, I, I think that we should understand what is happening now on the border um, oh, with the caging of migrants, the separating of children from their parents, um, what is happening in Europe um, with, you know, the, a system of uh, allowing thousands of people to drown in the Mediterranean, of offshoring the, um, the patrolling of the Mediterranean to the Libyan Coast Guard, who are you know, warlords, and all they're doing is rounding people up at sea and taking them to concentration camps. Australia has its own system of doing the same thing, bringing people to places like Nauru and Manus, these island detention facilities run by private companies. This is climate barbarism. Like, I think this is a picture of climate barbarism where, you know, as we know, the, the white supremacy surges in moments when it is needed as a justification for barbarism. And so it was, it was needed to justify slavery. It was needed to justify colonial land theft and it is needed to allow the fortressing of borders in the face of the reality that there are more people on the move mm. than at any point in human history, and there's going to be a lot more. And I think everybody knows this. And so this is not to say everybody who's moving is moving because of climate change. But climate change is a, one of the accelerants to conflict. It is, it, you know, it, is, it is a layering on all of these other stressors. And it is absolutely, and everyone knows this on some level, going to be going to be the major driver of, of dislocation. And so there is, we're at this fork in the road where either we are going to deal with this by just doubling down on our most brutal selves, and it's and it's going to be absolutely us versus them, and that is going to require. Uh, an intense hierarchy of humanity, and Trump is vocalizing this, right? Um, we're full, this is, you know, um, these are animals, these aren't real people, right? We're hearing this all the time now. Um, you know, or there's going to be a, um, an assertion of, of interconnected humanity, and I see like the youth climate strikers as being like the flip side of this, right? Um, who've come together across, you know, in every continent and thousands of cities, young people standing up for each other, um, building this global movement and standing up for their right to a future. And, you know, one of the most horrific sort of facts of history, and this is what I'm starting on fire with, is the fact that in New Zealand, um, the youth climate strike, the global climate strike, happened on the same day as the day that the Christchurch shooter went into those two mosques and killed 50 people. The kids were at their protest, and all of a sudden they were told they had to disperse because there were shots fired nearby. Um, so you know, here you have just in this one location like these sort of two <laughs> routes that we can take, right? So I think that's where we're at, you know. I think that's where we're at. I think it's majorly truth time. Um, and, you know, these are the stakes of what kind of stories we tell, you know. I, and I think, I think those of us who live in settler colonial states like this one, um, we are being so profoundly failed by our narratives, by our official narratives. And I think Greg Grandin's new book, um, The Death of the Myth, is so relevant to this because it is, you know, it's it's the telling of the 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 story of the idea of of there always being some other place to expand to, right? Um, which was always a lie, and there were always people there, and it was an incredibly violent process, right? But I think it explains why climate, the reality of climate change is, is so much harder to metabolize in this country um, than, say, in Europe, mm. um, in parts of our, like, in, you know, we're from Canada, you know, why it is so, uh, there's so much climate denial in Alberta. It's not just because of the oil. It's also because of the frontier myth. It's the West, you know. It's the idea of the West, the moving westward, there, and never, ha and always being able to escape your consequences, right? That's the whole that's the whole reason 
these countries were founded or stolen, right, was, you know, Europe hit its ecological boundaries. And then it was like, oh, we found a New England. You know, like that's a really crazy idea, New England. <laughs> you know? We found New France and it's huge, you know. Like we, we'll never run out of trees or beaver, you know. And so like the idea that we've like hit that wall is, is you know, either, either we respond with the wall, which is the, the Trump route, or we say like it was always a lie. You know, we need new stories where it's not constantly about displacing crises onto new locations, where it's actually about saying, we're here, you know, how do we live here <laughs> with each other and repair our relationships with each other, with history, with the land, with our stuff. We actually have to repair our stuff, you know. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I, I used to imagine that part of what the contemporary political moment seemed to imply was kind of last gasp of a certain sort of reactionary hate filled. I'm not sure I believe that anymore, um, but I remain hopeful that at that fork in the road, there's still enough goodwill, enough folks operating in good faith that will take the, the right path and, and the, probably the harder path in a lot of ways right. um, and not the wrong one. But um, Yeah, and I mean, this is why I am hopeful about the Green New Deal because I, I do see it as an opportunity to tell another story and to have another kind of civilizational mission, right? Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I don't think, I don't think, I think that idea that it's a last, last gasp, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go down without a fight. Um, there's, there's more gasps left in that beast. Um, so yeah, what, what, what's our gasp? <laughs> Thanks, Naomi. Thanks for asking my questions. I'm sure folks have been waiting very patiently. Um, so maybe we have about 15 minutes um, for questions from you all. You want to take your own questions, or you want me to decide? You decide. Okay. All right. <laughs> so who's first up to bat? Oh, just to cover it up. Jess. question a different way, which was, um, I have been wondering ever since the Snowden disclosures, like, what conspiracy even looks like anymore? Like, <laughs> uh, in 2011, if you said, government's reading all your emails, man, and it's like, it knows everything about your Facebook, it's got all, people would say, you are a conspiracy theorist, and I'm not going to listen to you. And I don't buy all these folks who are like, well, we knew, we knew that was happening. Well, you didn't. You wouldn't have been using stuff that way if you knew. That's just like a, a fantasy of asserting control back onto the past. So um, yeah. I'm interested in what has, I, I don't think the conspiracy thing is like a, a figure that we have in the same way that we used to before it's noted. I think what has kind of replaced it is this like resigned, like a uh, disempowered zombie, kind of like we're, or like the figure of the addict, you know, that you even, Mentioned, so I'm kind of trying to look for a, a thing that is, it, it, what is productive now about the idea of, of conspiracy? And like, is, what, is there any hope in the conspiracy, you know, attention? Because I, I love that you were so, um, like, protective of that figure, right? Like, you were like, no, we, we should be conspiratorial, and like, we should believe in conspiracy theories. I said that? Yeah, at this talk, right? You were sort of like, well, Kate <laughs> Jackson was sort of like, why shouldn't we be conspiracy theorists? And you're like, no, we should be. Like, we should. Like. Well, I, I mean, I think, I think we should be. I think it's just capitalism. I mean, I don't think it's a conspiracy. Um, you know, I think it's a business model um, that is that is unregulated and um, and it has a, its logic. And I mean, I, I. So I mean, it's interesting the role that these sort of. You asked about like people feeling like their phones are listening to them, right? And I feel like we keep sort of raising the bar where it's kind of where and then and then it's sort of that's dispelled, or we think it's dispelled. No, like your phone is not listening to your conversations with your friends and then selling you things that that you talked about and it can't read your mind. But it no, it's just surveilling everything that you write and 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 mining all of your data without your consent and and so. And, and so, but that, and that becomes okay because it's not this other thing that 
is sort of more out there. <clears throat> it's kind of like what just happened with Trump, <laughs> you know, in the sense that, like, okay, so maybe he's not, um, you know, actively working for the Russian government, you know, as a Manchurian candidate, but. And because he didn't meet that bar, then he's in the clear, right? And that all of these, uh, you know, other outrages, in comparison to that. And this is why, you know, I have been critical of the media outlets that really went so far down the sort of the Mueller you know, um, reality show um, formula. Is that I think they did such a disservice to the conspiracies right in front of us um, that are actually not conspiracies; they're just what he is doing, and we have to just do like good old-fashioned journalism and you know amplify that and explain to people what the stakes are. And but it's never going to be as sexy as like the Tom Clancy story that you know Putin put Trump in office and and so on. And and so I think in in a weird way these sort of out like the, the more outrageous conspiracy theories make the actual reality of what is happening seem less dangerous, right? And, and we do ourselves a disservice in that way. Thanks, Tom. I, I will say, and this might not be a representative sample of Alexa owners, but every single Alexa owner I know believes genuinely that they're being surveilled all the time. They assume <laughs> it, they kind of say it jokingly, but you realize they're not joking. They, but they're, they're seemingly OK with it, because they still have it there. Throw your Alexas you know, to the river. But I think there is a. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it all together now. <laughs> but there is this kind of level of comfortability with the inevitability of it that I think is very powerful and relatively new, I think, even if we might retroactively imagine what's the past. Um, you were going to ask something, I think, Barbie. Would you hand up? Uh, yeah. So actually, you just brought up a third example of something that I was kind of hearing you talk. And first of all, thank you. That was wonderfully expansive and very informative. Um, which is, you, you have been cycling back to the point that if we only understood more, things would be different. If journalists had thought differently about adverse and inequality, they wouldn't have been so surprised. If we could only articulate more about uh, privacy, then we, people, the younger generation, would understand why this is a problem. I want, I want to agree with you. I do agree with you. But I also want to say, somewhere in the back of my head, what if that's not all that will solve it? <laughs> so what if it's not just about sharing information and better explanation? What if it's deeper? Mm -hmm. And what if it's more complex? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think in a lot of these cases, I don't think it's that just knowing information would change things. But I do think that there are stories around <clears throat> collective action, right, that are transformative. Um, you know, I, I think that one of, the, one of the things our media has, has failed us most on is um, is, is telling those stories of people actually succeeding, of getting together and winning against more powerful forces. And, you know, like where we, what, what I find with my students is, you know, the, the, most, the, the, the most prevalent uh, uh, obstacle is, is not their inability to analyze this. It is their feeling that they are one person up against these huge forces. And that's why you know, having Michelle visit the class was so important, because she was telling them stories about people like them working crappy jobs as baristas and you know, being exploited by their, by, you know, or driving lifts or whatever it was, getting together with fellow workers and taking on their bosses, even about something small like a dress code issue, um, and then realizing, you know, we can do this. And I see you know, Sarah Jaffe cheering, because she does this full time. She tells these stories full time of workers, you know, heroic stories of workers who have been had been indoctrinated in the uh, in in the culture of there is no alternative, you know, for 40 years and beaten down and beaten down and then they finally decide actually, you know what? We're going to take on the oil industry in West Virginia, you know, and get more money for schools and got it, you know. Um, and so the and this is so related to climate change because when you talk to people about why they feel despair, right? It's not just because they're watching um, walruses commit suicide alone on their couch um, on Netflix, but that's hard. You know, that's really, really hard. Um, it's because they have grown up their entire lives being told that they're fundamentally selfish, 
that all they are individuals um, that only want to just get rich and 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 you know just make things better for themselves. Um, and they haven't grown up with stories of how the world can change um, because they've never seen it change. They're the only thing, their only experience of collective spaces has been their dismantling. Um, and their and and so um, when what, you know when they hear models like different ownership models, success stories. That's why you know Avi and I made that film about factory workers in the you know in the first place. Is just because we feel like we don't have these examples of how people actually change their destinies. Um, so that to me is the most important <laughs> gap in our knowledge. And this is when you scratch the surface of where people are at with climate change, they don't think we're worth saving. <laughs> you know. Um, that they've, we've, so many people have been told how sort of um, just fundamentally, you know, nasty, uh, selfish people are that they don't believe that there's another version of being human that might actually, uh, you know, do things differently. Every time they see a Hollywood film of the future, it takes. And a, 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 you know, ecological collapse for granted. They're not like every and, and our cultural narratives are these narratives of you know collapse and a few people get saved. I mean, we are this is hardwired in our narratives, and so um, you know I think that you know, that's the other reason why I am excited about the Green New Deal um, is because it remind like it forces a conversation about a time when. When, when big things happened <laughs> um, and when there was an interplay between social movements and government that achieved big things and left huge numbers of people out. And we have to talk about that too. We have to talk about how black workers were excluded you know, in agriculture, domestic work. We have to talk about um, you know, the fact that, that the 30s were a period of mass deportations for Mexicans, we, you know, all of it. There's huge problems with the, with the New Deal, but let's talk about a moment, a mass organization of society, of, 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 of debating huge ideas in public, of you know, uh, that, that, that pressure from the outside that made the New Deal look like a compromise because the alternative was revolution. When we're telling those stories, I think we're doing the most important thing. Because whenever I, like, and I've talked to so many thousands of people about climate change, they can, like the first thing they ask me is, what should I buy? You know, what can I do as an individual? I'm like, nothing. You're not going to stop the melting of the Arctic by yourself. Like, what a crazy idea, you know? And, but that is how they've grown up. They've been told that, 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 that you, you change things with how you shop. You, you know, you, you change things as an individual. Um, they don't have models for collective action, right? And so that's the game changer, I think. Thanks. Um, we have time for what, two more, maybe? One, two. Okay, I'm told one more. You're you're, you're the lucky person. Well, I, yeah. well, I'll ask, then I'll ask two. Oh, uh, okay. The first one is um, uh, when I witnessed the uh, testimony of Elliot Abrams at the House earlier this year and Congressman Omar's questioning of him. I thought that was a unique opportunity for the traditional media to connect Reagan's policies in Central America from 30 years ago to the current challenge we have with refugees or, or immigrants on our on our borders. But I didn't see anywhere in the traditional press was where that, that teachable moment was taken advantage of. And so my first question is, did you see anybody do it? Because I didn't. And um, is that an example of the stories that we need to tell ourselves? Mm -hmm. And then the second question was, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Shorenstein lecturer Nolan Bowie wrote a piece about uh, the challenges of having all of your data mined and being subjected to the vicissitudes of the digital marketplace. And that in individuals should copyright their activity and become owners of themselves, and then sell their identity to the highest bidder. And so I was interested in those two questions, if you could answer. Okay. Well, was the second one a question? Pardon me? Um, well, I think yeah, it was what do you think, think about copyright. that? Copywriting yourself. Copyright. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. I'm not sure I can answer the second one. I, I, I mean, my knee-jerk response is no. Um, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I would hope that there is, like, there are other models for getting back control of our data. And I think I would put that in the category of how we think that 
we can do this only as individuals and not um, with with some pretty serious policy. <laughs> um, and um, the Elliot Abrams, I mean, yeah, I think some people did. I'll do a plug for the intercept. You know, uh, we did a lot on that. Um, you, you know, I, 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 I think there are some spaces that are doing this, but it tends to be smaller podcasts like Intercepted or The Dig, and you know, people should people should listen <laughs> and support. Um, but I think that. This, you know, this is really related to the kind of frontier narrative and mythology. Like, there is no past. Like, the whole point is, it's a do. It's a, it's the do-over country. It's always year zero. You know, <laughs> and this, you know, the, it, and this is, you know, part of what we need to challenge, right? I mean, this is, and this is one of the reasons why another one of the reasons why climate change is so hard to metabolize in a settler colonial state. You know, it actually says the past matter. You know. Um, carbon accumulates over centuries in the atmosphere and then says, hey, you thought you were in charge? Um, maybe not, right? Um, and this idea, it forces you to think in geologic time, it forces you to think about act, you know, actions having consequences in the future, there being continuums, and that, you know, the whole, that, that, the whole way that the dominant media discourse has metabolized Trump is just like completely divorced from the past and indeed being used to cleanse the past, right? Every single former, you know, every single war criminal has been rehabilitated by Trump because in comparison to Trump, they look fantastic, supposedly. Um, but, you know, to me it's, it's yeah, it's, I mean, if we look at what's happened with, with George W. Bush, for instance, so, yeah, there haven't, there, like, but I don't think we get at this problem just with like, you should, this was a teachable moment, you should have talked about the 80s. I think we need to get at this deeper question of the war on history that is so central uh, in this country. And it's like why you can't have a conversation about reparations or slavery. It's like, that's the past. We don't talk about the past, you know? Um, and, and so the idea that it might actually be good to talk about the past um, would be, that's the conversation that we need to have. Thank you for that. Thank you for the serious thinking that you <laughs> do and for joining us tonight. Please join me in the class.